become Sarah Forbes Vanessa Davis. She's just got married and she's wearing her wedding dress. Can you tell me a bit about her? Yes, certainly. I think to understand this, we need just to think a little bit about Africa in the 1850s and the part of Africa that is now Nigeria. Um, there was a king there, King Gezo, of an area called Dahomey. And he was involved in the slave trade. He was capturing Africans and selling them um, on to slavers. And the British, who were very opposed to slavery, sent out to him a man called Commander Frederick Forbes to try and persuade him to give up being involved in the slave trade. So that's the kind of background to Sarah's story. Actually, to understand Sarah's story, I think what we need to do is just imagine ourselves back to the age of eight. She had already, by the age of eight, experienced the village that she grew up in being sacked by troops. She experienced the death of both her parents. She was at that point, aged eight, a slave, a prisoner of the king, King Gezo, and she was facing almost certain death. At that point, Commander Forbes arrives and starts his negotiations with King Gezo. Now, King Gezo, I think possibly even to embarrass this wretched man from Britain who's come to try and stop him from doing what he wants to do and is interfering, decided that what he would do would be to give this girl as a present via Commander Forbes to be taken back. So there she is, not only have all these things happened to her, she's now treated as an object, a thing that can be handed from one person to another. I and mean, it's just the most terrible thing that you could ever do to a human being. She was handed over. Commander Forbes took her back to his ship. Now, the first thing that he did was actually to change her name. So her whole identity becomes changed at that point. We don't actually, I think, know her African name, her real name, the name that her parents called her. He decided to give her a new name. So he decided to call her Sarah. He decided to call her Forbes, obviously, after himself. And his ship was the HMS Bonetta. So that's how she got the Bonetta bit of her name. And he brought her to England, where she was a gift for Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria then became involved in her upbringing. What happened next? Queen Victoria, um, having taken this, this young girl under her wing and started providing money for her living and for her education, decided that Sarah should be sent to Sierra Leone, back to Africa, to go to a missionary school, and that's where she should be educated. Sarah, meanwhile, had um, actually, even, even on the voyage over to, Br to Britain, had learned to speak English, English brilliantly. And she was clearly showing great intellectual promise. She was a very, very bright young child, despite all the things that had happened to her. And then um, Queen Victoria wanted her to come back again, so she returned. We can see again, she's being treated like a parcel here. Um, you know, yes, the Queen is being very generous, and in some ways very kind to her within her own if you like, limited understanding. But Sarah definitely has to do what, what she's told. And then when Sarah comes back, what Queen Victoria's next aim for her is, is to get her married. And Queen Victoria finds who she thinks is a suitable candidate, a man called James Davis. Um, he's a lot older than Sarah. Sarah's 18, he's 31. But, but Victoria and other people think he's suitable. Sarah seems to have put up a bit of resistance to this. He doesn't, she certainly doesn't seem to have agreed straight away. But it has to be said that during the course of her education, she shows incredible intelligence and skills, particularly music, actually. She's a very musical person. Um, she has very strong opinions. She holds her own very well in conversation. Um, a lot of people like her. Um, Commander Forbes himself said you know, that she was she was much more intelligent than, than most British girls of, of her age. She she showed real real problems. Can you tell me a bit about her wedding? 
yes, it was a great event. It took place in Brighton and she had this beautiful, beautiful wedding dress. Lots of people came down from London for the wedding, but she came on the train. Um, huge numbers turned up. It was a wet Thursday afternoon, which is probably not the most fun to get married on, um, but it created a, a, a huge event in the town. She was married in the church of St Nicholas. And interestingly, the, it's the um, newspaper accounts talk about the white men walking with the black women and the black men walking with the white women. You know, the actual event went very well. And then she came to London, I mean, basically, I think, for a honeymoon. And that's when the photograph was taken. Now, if you look at the photograph, you'll see that she's got a very extraordinary background behind her. And this is taken in a photographer's studio. So in the picture, there are some things that are real, obviously her and her clothes. And actually the chair that she's holding is, is real. But a lot of what's behind her is actually simply a painted backdrop. The other thing to say about it is when you look at the photograph, you know, it's full length of her. It, it looks quite big. It's actually tiny. These things are called carte de visite. They're really quite small pictures. A bit like collecting football stickers. It was that sort of idea that, that lots, because photography was cheap, lots of these images could be created and, and you'd sort of form a collection of them. So what happened after she got married? They went to live in Lagos. Quite soon after she got married, um, she had her first child, a little girl and she got permission from Queen Victoria to name her child Victoria. And actually, Queen Victoria was, her, was the godmother of this child. And then, very sadly, quite young, Sarah has, herself got very ill. She got a disease called tuberculosis. Then, all you could do was to move to a climate that was considered healthy for your lungs. Um, and she actually went off to the island of Madeira um, to try and recover some of her health. But very sadly, she didn't recover. She died there and she's buried in Funchal in, in Madeira. Why do you think she's been forgotten by historians? History is all about what questions you ask. You need to ask the right questions and then you find people like her. Historians in the past were concerned with laws and with battles and with you know, kings, all of those sorts of things. And of course, if those are the questions that you are, you are asking about those sorts of people, you won't find Sarah, will you? What I think has happened is that actually Sarah hasn't been totally forgotten and she's now becoming more remembered because the kinds of questions that we are now asking are about what was the experience of those who went through slavery? What was that like for people? So why do you think that she's significant today? It's as a role model, actually. I mean, that resilience that I was talking about is really important. A way of coping with the most terrible things. But the other thing, I think, in the wider historical context, is to give us a much better understanding of, say, Victorian London and what it was like. It's not just white people. There are black people, there's a black presence in London, and a black presence that interacts at the highest level, in this case, with Queen Victoria. It just gives us all a much richer history together to understand how people in the past interacted with each other.